What is the greatest f*** it? I'll do it myself in history. Part 1. Canadian soldier Leo Major and his friend Willy Arsenault were scouting a Dutch town called Svula that had been captured by Germans in WW2. On this scouting trip, the two had decided to liberate Svula together, but were spotted and Arsenault was killed. Major, enraged, killed two Germans while the rest fled. On the outskirts of the town, Major intercepted a vehicle, disarming the soldiers there. He told a French-speaking soldier that all the Canadian artillery would be firing on the town in the morning, and decidedly let the Nazi free to spread the rumor, even returning his weapon as a total alpha move. That night, Major decided to single-handedly liberate the town. Arming himself with many weapons, he made explosions and noise, making it sound like the entire Canadian army was there. Several times that night, Major went back and forth from Svola to the Canadian base taking 8 to 10 German prisoners each time. At one point, Major located the Gestapo, high-ranking Nazis, headquarters and raided it himself. He killed several SS officers and the rest fled. By morning, Major discovered that the Germans who had taken Svola had entirely retreated. I should also mention that Major was a sniper who had only one eye from a phosphorus grenade explosion years prior and remained in the military because he insisted he only needed one eye to aim his weapon and that to him, he looked like a pirate. This is by turns, badass hilarious brilliant pirate. Let's not forget that Isaac Newton ran out of math to work with and was like, I guess I'll just invent calculus then. He was self-quarantined during the plague. Otis invented pretty much what we consider the modern elevator. Nobody was convinced it was safe so he hoisted himself up extremely high and had somebody cut the cable with an axe to prove how confident he was that the elevator was safe regardless of almost worst case scenarios. Otis UK are based in Reading. When they answer the phone they say, hello, Otis Reading. In the UK telecoms giant Siemens has an HQ in Staines. Guess what they say when they answer the phones. To finish OP's story, the safety locking mechanism kicked in, and the elevator stopped after only a few inches. He survived. Had it failed there at the New York World's Fair, we probably wouldn't have elevators today. In 1888, Almond Brown Strouger, an undertaker, noticed he was losing a lot of business to the other undertaker in town. He found out that the other undertaker's wife was a telephone operator and when she intercepted people asking to be connected to Strouger's funeral home, the operator would route the call to her husband's funeral home instead. Three years later, Strouger patented the automatic teller exchange, a system which allowed telephone users to make calls without the need for human operators, single-handedly destroying an entire workforce. Imagine being so pissed off you don't just get someone fired, but remove their job from existence entirely. The biggest fuck you, I have seen to date. Cliff Stoll, the cuckoo's egg, noticed weird traffic on his university servers. No one believed him that there was any risk occurring. Ended up uncovering a major hacking attempt to steal missile designs and basically created internet security. I think it was missile designs, it's been a long time. Jon Snow, not that one, the father of epidemiology. No one believed him that the cholera outbreak in what is now Soho was because of a contaminated water pump. He broke it. They arrested him for vandalism and held him until the outbreak suddenly ended. He was also a pioneer when it came to anesthetics. Queen Victoria permitted him to put her under for the birth of two of her children. I visited his memorial in Brompton Cemetery a few years ago. He's right round the corner from Emmeline Pankhurst's grave. Both sites had fresh flowers on them. Donald Knuth is one of the big names in computer science. Back in the 1960s he set out to write the definitive texts on computer programming and analysis of algorithms. The first three volumes came out and he started the fourth in the early, mid-1970s. He was unhappy with how the newer printing, editions were typeset and so he took a summer to, solve, that problem. A decade later the fourth volume still had not been completed, but as a consolation prize we got Tex, later extended to the more commonly used LaTeX, without question the most comprehensive and powerful language for creating documents with heavy technical requirements, it is a strange mix of a markup language like HTML and a compiled language like C. It is completely free and has been for well over 30 years and is probably the most bug-free piece of software I've ever seen. Certainly for its size and scope, there's not much out there of comparable quality. There is literally no mathematics that cannot be properly typeset in text, latex. Its default style is instantly recognizable to any working mathematician. It is used across nearly all STEM fields and there are hundreds, if not thousands, of journals that only accept manuscripts written in latex. It wasn't until the early 2000s that drafts of the fourth volume started to appear. 
nobody has seemed to mind. Probably the time Nando Parado and Roberto Canessa decided they couldn't wait around any longer and legged it for 10 days across the Andes with no warm clothes, climbing gear, or food except some scraps of their dead friends stuffed into a sock. They finally found someone out in the middle of nowhere, Sergio Catalan, who rode horseback all night and then took a bus to get some help. The mountain climbers had come from the wreckage of a crashed plane that everyone had been looking for for over two months. They needed help for the other survivors who were injured and starving. They saved 14 of their friends. There's a book written about it by one of the survivors himself, Miracle in the Andes, 72 Days on the Mountain and My Long Trek Home by Nando Parado. I never watched the movie, but the book still gets me to this day. It is one of the most disturbing depictions of humans' ability to survive even under the deadliest circumstances. A really humbling read, reminding us of our own fragility and how terrible fleeting everything truly is. It's gotta be Amo Koivunen he was a Finnish soldier in the Second World War when the Finns were trying to reclaim land from the Soviets. He got separated from his unit mid-war in the middle of nowhere he was the one tasked to carry the drugs they held in case of injury or tiredness, one of which was pervitin, which was literal meth in a tablet form. Instead of just taking one or two, he downed the whole bottle and went on a week's long methed up rampage. He got hit by a landmine, evaded Soviet soldiers, caught a bird and ate it raw, all while on skis. He finally made it back to finish lines where on arrival, he weighed only 90 pounds or so and had a heart rate of 200 beats per minute. He ended up living for another 45 years. I fucking love it whenever this story gets mentioned. It's so crazy as to be unbelievable but it's true. A movie needs to be made about this guy. Brian Acton interviewed at Facebook and got turned down. He said fuck it and built WhatsApp. Several years later, Facebook bought WhatsApp for $19 billion. Maurice Hilleman invented over 40 vaccines during his career in the pharmaceutical industry. In 1963 his oldest daughter caught the mumps. He cultured a sample from her, developed a vaccine, and injected it into his younger daughter. That vaccine is still in use and has saved millions of lives. In total, it's estimated that his work has saved 118 million lives globally. And because he used it on his daughter it is to this day the fastest any effective vaccine has ever been produced. Fun fact. This vaccine is also the fastest ever to be made in history, from start to finish taking only four years from the beginning of development to the first distribution. This is also why it is unlikely that we will get a vaccine faster than a year for the current epidemic. The guy who started FedEx wrote a college paper about a nationwide overnight shipping company, and got a C. Started the company anyways. Later after he started it and it was struggling, he couldn't get a loan and the company was almost bankrupt, and he bet next week's payroll at the casino on roulette and won. Also got a silver star in the Vietnam War and now co-owns the Washington Redskins. The latter often viewed as the biggest failure in his life. It was blackjack, not roulette. I'll make my own shipping company. With blackjack and hookers. The giant Norse axeman who held the choke point at the Battle of Stamford Bridge, by the time the bulk of the English army had arrived, the Vikings on the west side were either slain or fleeing across the bridge. The English advance was then delayed by the need to pass through the choke point presented by the bridge itself. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle has it that a giant Norse axeman, possibly armed with a Dane axe, blocked the narrow crossing and single-handedly held up the entire English army. The story is that this axeman cut down up to 40 Englishmen and was defeated only when an English soldier floated under the bridge in a half-barrel and thrust his spear through the planks in the bridge, mortally wounding the axeman. George Clooney bought his own spy satellite to prove the alleged crimes of an African warlords because nobody else would. The kicker is that he's using all his earnings from shilling Nespresso to do it. Also, I thought he was buying time on it and did not outright purchase a satellite? 